Bibles open again at 1 Peter, can we? Uh, it's great to be together this morning. I'm sure many of you will have seen this week uh, that uh, Tim Keller went to be with the Lord, great theologian, great pastor, uh, and definitely a loss to the, the Christian world. Incredible teacher. Many of you will have read his books. Um, but I want to point out his example more than anything else. Uh, in a day when so many Christian leaders seem to fall and fail. He's one who made it to the finish line and who will receive the well done, good and faithful servant, unblemished, untainted. And uh, he's a great example to us all. If you've never read any of his books, I'd encourage you, get hold of them. Really accessible, absolutely brilliant. Um, A theologian pastor who really did the church good. And I just wanted to begin this morning just by honouring him in mentioning his passing. Um, We're going to be back in 1 Peter this morning. Uh, I've titled this message, A Tale of Three Floods. Uh, But before we get to that, I want to ask a very important doctrinal question. I wonder if we could put up the PowerPoint. Would that be okay for the... um, There's a picture coming up, hopefully. What's your favorite sandwich? Okay, tough one. Uh, Sai, what's your favorite sandwich? Chicken and bacon. He's going for the, all, all the meats. Uh, how about, let's ask Anne. Tuna. bit fishy going on there. My personal favorite is like the New Yorker, where you get a bit of pastrami, you get some, uh, some nice spicy mustard in it as well, some nice Emmental cheese or something like that. I love that combo. Um, I think the sandwich is a brilliant invention, to be honest with you. Apparently, it was invented by John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, in 1762. And the legend is that he was playing cards, having a long card session. Uh, He didn't want to get, he didn't want to leave the table, got hungry. So he said to one of the people who was working in the card, wherever he was gambling, you know, I want you to go and get me some roast beef, but can you shove it in between two bits of bread so that I can... uh, eat it without leaving the table, and uh, I don't know, Boots and Tesco's meal deals have been thanking him ever since, I guess. Um, Now, my reason for mentioning sandwiches is that the scripture we're going to come to today is structured a bit like a sandwich. It's got a a top and bottom layer that kind of hold everything in, and inside is some filling. And, And that will help us to understand the scripture a little bit, and we will need some help in understanding the scripture that we're coming to today. Don Carson, the theologian and uh, teacher, he said that the five verses that we're going to look at this morning are among the most difficult in the New Testament to interpret. So thanks, Dave. I appreciate you giving me this passage to preach on. Um, But we're going to need that little bit of help of having a a bit of structure in mind as we come to it. Let's draw back to the very wide context of the, the scripture we're going to come to. Obviously, it's in this letter of 1 Peter that was written to those who were becoming Christians in Asia Minor. Uh, And as a result of that, they were facing certain bits of persecution, being left out of certain things in culture, and generally being a bit mocked for their faith. And so that's the kind of context we're looking at. But the immediate context of this bit of the passage is very uh, aligned to the other themes in the whole letter, in that it's also about how how we handle suffering, and in particular, how we handle suffering for for doing good and for following Jesus. And so in this bit we're going to read, Peter points to the ultimate example of what it means to suffer for the sake of righteousness. And that ultimate example, obviously, is Jesus. And so Jesus is the bread in this sandwich. The passage that we're going to read begins with something about Jesus uh, and his suffering to bring us to God. And then the last verse, the bottom layer of the sandwich, if you like, is also about Jesus and where he ended up, and that's all good news. The filling in the sandwich is about a bit about Noah and a bit about us, and in the middle is a little bit of spicy sauce in verse 19 with some spicy doctrine that some of you will spot, um, which we'll get to in a moment. So let's get into God's Word, which has no mention of sandwiches whatsoever, although bread and fish do feature from time to time. Chapter 3 of 1 Peter verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, 
because they formally did not obey when God's presence waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone up into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So, an interesting passage of Scripture, and I want to address it by looking and thinking about three floods. Two of them are global floods. One of them has a global impact that has to be applied personally. But all three of these floods are connected. So, flood number one is mentioned in verse 20. So, I'm kind of starting in the middle of the passage. This is what it says in verse 20, and it's a global flood. Verse 20 says this, Because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So here we're talking and looking at that Old Testament narrative, the flood that we know about from Noah. You can read about it in Genesis chapters 6 through to 9. I'm not going to retell the story to you today. I'm sure many of you will know the story of Noah. What I want us to understand is why the story of Noah is connected in Peter's mind to the other two floods he mentions in this verse. So the flood of Noah, we know it was a flood that was a flood of judgment. It was a flood of judgment on humanity because humanity had fallen. Humanity was disobedient. So by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it simply says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And so there's a, this all-pervasive sin in the world. And God being in nature, God who is holy, who is perfect, who is pure, who is untainted, by his very nature, he could not allow sin in the world to go unpunished. Hence the flood. Hence it being a flood of judgment. God's judgment on a fallen humanity, on a broken creation, on a rebellious people. Now, you'll also notice that in verse 20, it reminds us that God also exercised patience. He didn't just get angry and decide to wipe out creation. He waited and he looked and he's looking for someone righteous. And then he waits while that righteous man decides to be obedient and walk in faith and construct out of wood and pitch a huge rescue vessel. And that ark, that boat, that was a form of rescue for those God had spotted who was righteous. A few, just eight people it says in the passage as we read. Noah and his family. There was some righteousness there and they found favor in God's eyes and God got them on the ark, rescued them and as they came out of the ark post the flood, he reminded them and reinstituted his instructions, his part of the covenant to them to then go and multiply and fill the earth just as he had done with Adam at creation. And he made a covenant with them that if they were to do that, he would never again flood the earth. So this is the flood that we're talking about. And there are three important takeaways from this Noahic flood, this first flood, that will connect it to the other two floods. And the three takeaways are this. God is righteous, humans are disobedient. Okay, takeaway number one. God is righteous, humans are disobedient. They had been from the first generation. Second takeaway, God is patient. He waited. God is patient but humans are disobedient. So God could only find Noah and his family. Everybody else, presumably, was guilty. And third takeaway, God is a rescuer, but humans are disobedient. You remember, shortly after the, the tale of the flood, it's only one chapter later that the Tower of Babel comes, and so people are still walking in disobedience. 
But the flood was a means that God instituted. It was a way that he found of remaining both just and righteous and not letting sin go unpunished and yet extending love and forgiveness to those early humans because he offered them the opportunity of rescue and a second chance. So that was flood number one, the Noah flood. Some righteousness there, God rescues them, floods the earth, they are rescued. Judgment comes upon the rest of humanity. But that flood gives us the backdrop to flood number two. Verse 21, Peter says this, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this second flood, Peter says, is the flood of baptism. The immersing in water, the soaking, the drenching, the deluging of a life with water. And Peter says that corresponds to the first flood, the Noah flood. Now, by the word baptism here, we know that Peter is referring to the lasting ordinance for the church to carry out the Great Commission by seeing people become Christians and then immersing them in water. It's that thing that we do, whether we go to the beach for it or we do it in a river or we put up a portable baptistry and we dunk people into the water. It's that time we love when we have those great testimonies and great celebrations of lives that have been transformed. That's what he's talking about. When people go public with their faith and demonstrate that they truly have crossed the line and they truly have become a believer in Jesus and they don't care any longer who sees it and who knows it. Now, there's a challenge here, and I don't want you to fall into any dodgy doctrine Peter says something, but he doesn't mean what he says. So Peter says, baptism saves you. Baptism saves you. Really? Can that be what Peter actually means? Getting wet in a big tank of water or in the river gives us eternal life and rescues us from the judgment of God? Well, we need to apply a a hermeneutical principle here in that you can't make doctrine from one verse. And only this one verse would say it like that. But all the other verses relating to baptism help us to understand that it's it's a picture. It's a metaphor. It's a symbol. It's a powerful demonstration of an internal spiritual change, but it's demonstrated on the outside. But... By putting it in this way, Peter is saying that baptism is synonymous with your salvation. It's part of your salvation package, if you like. See, in Jesus' day and in the early church, it was part all part of the same thing. So you become a Christian, you get baptized, and you join a local church. That was the way that it all happened. It was all just part of the one thing. They weren't three massive separate steps divided by long periods of doubt and anxiety and worry and preparation and thinking, am I ready? Am I mature enough? Is this for me? There was none of that. You, you, you came out of sin. You came into salvation. You came into the church through the waters of baptism. That was how it happened. Come to Christ come through the waters of baptism, come to the church. And in the early church, there wasn't such a thing as an unbaptized Christian or a baptized Christian who wasn't part of the church. It was all this one big deal that happened. And if you think about it, it's a bit like the way we consider engagement and marriage. So if you imagine engagement, in engagement, You've you've spoken of your commitment to one another. You're living within the promises that you're preparing to make to one another. But it's actually the moment that you exchange rings and take vows and sign the certificate that everybody in the outside world then views you as married. You might have made the promises a long time ago, but now you've done it. Now you've done it. And it's a little bit like that. You see, baptism is that lasting ordinance that certifies your salvation. Yes, I have done it. It kind of brings that measure of, yes, I know, and I've declared it to all around me. And Peter says that this isn't a superficial thing. It's not like, oh, great, I've just been cleansed on the outside. I've just kind of cleaned my life up a little bit. The surface dirt has come off the body. 
He says it's, it's, it's a demonstration of a deep and profound inward spiritual transaction between God and a person. Because it's about the cleansing, not just of their body, but the cleansing of their mind. It's about a whole conscience cleansing. It's about forgiveness. It's about a new heart and a new start. And boy, didn't we all need that. We did. Now, the important thing that we need to understand from Peter's writing here is that this corresponds to that. Noah's flood corresponds to this flood of baptism. How so? Well, can you remember the three things that I said to you about that first flood? The three things I said were God is, God is righteous, humans are disobedient. God is patient, humans are disobedient. And God is a rescuer, humans are disobedient. Now, we have to take that from a global perspective, humanity and externalizing it, to a personal perspective and internalize it. We're going to have to apply this to us. You ready for a little bit of pain? Let's take those three, three phrases that I mentioned again. Instead of externalizing it and making it about everybody, let's make it about us. So God is righteous, but you are disobedient. God is patient, but you are disobedient. And God is a rescuer, but you are disobedient. You see, this is how this corresponds to that. This is how this flood of baptism corresponds to Noah's flood. You see, what we bring to this righteous and patient and rescuing God is our disobedience and our sin. And that is all we bring. That is all we bring. It's all we have to offer. Just like the broken humanity of Noah's day, there is no righteousness to be found. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all sin and err. And as a result, we all deserve the judgment in the same way that it was meted out in Noah's day. But remember I said God is a rescuer. God is a rescuer. And what he did incredibly with Noah was he found a way. He found a way through the waters of judgment. He found a way for those in which he found this amount of righteousness. He found a way for them to be rescued and shut in and safe and, and, and passed through unscathed the judgment of God. He found a way with Noah. And the good news is that he also found a way with you, which is incredible. It's incredible. Noah and his family in the ark brought through the rivers of the waters of judgment. If you're a Christian, you've also entered an ark. You've entered an ark, not one made of gopher wood and pitch this time, but one made of flesh and blood and bones. Your ark is the ark of Jesus Christ. You see, what we see in the Old Testament flood and the ark, it's what we call a type of Christ. It's a picture. It's an Old Testament glimpse of something much greater that came, something much more full that came in Christ. And just as there was righteousness found in Noah and he was brought onto the boat and they were rescued and they passed through, so in Christ, those who enter in, those who are shut in, find rescue and forgiveness, even though the only thing they brought to the party was disobedience and sin. You see, God found a way. And it's incredible. Now, of course, there's a reality to the fact that only eight were on the ark. Which gives us an indication of a profound challenge for us. Everyone outside the ark perished. Everyone. And of course, the implication, if this is connected to that, if this corresponds to that, if the Noah thing corresponds to the baptism thing, the implication for us is that those who are in the ark of Jesus are safe, but those who are not in the ark of Jesus are not safe. And they still face the judgment of God upon their lives. So that's why these two are so connected. And so if you're here today and you think, actually, I've never come to Christ myself. I've never come in. Can I just urge you, get on the ark. Get on board. Find forgiveness. Find your conscience claimed. Find yourself in a place where you're saved and rescued from 
the judgment that is to come upon all the earth. For surely the flood that comes at the end of time is going to be far more pervasive than anything we've ever experienced in the Old Testament. And that will happen one day. All things will be wrapped up. Are you on board? Are you safe? Has your sin been covered by being brought into the ark of Christ? I want to get onto the third flood, but before I get onto the third flood, I just want to address what is perhaps one of the weirdest and most debated verses in the New Testament which is verse 19. Let me read it. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to the end of the second half of verse 18 and maybe the beginning of 20, just to give you the context. For Christ also suffered for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, verse 19, in which he, that's Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. Let me just read verse 19 again. So, in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. Weird, isn't it? An unusual verse. Um, Let me help us through just momentarily and then we'll come back to the third flood. This verse really, interpretation of this verse really hangs on three questions. Who? Who are the spirits in prison that Jesus is preaching to and proclaiming to? Um, What is the second question? What did Jesus actually proclaim to these spirits in prison? And the third question is when? When did this happen? Now, who are the spirits in prison? Well, some people would look at this and say they were the the, the dead unbelievers who are now currently in hell. So people that haven't come to faith, people that are ungodly, and who are now in hell. Others have interpreted and said, no, he's talking here about Old Testament believers who are believing but are in an intermediate state awaiting the resurrection of all things. Others have said, no, these, these ones, these spirits in prison are fallen angels. Now, depending on what you think of the who was Jesus proclaiming to, then flicks on to, well, how did... How do we interpret what he said to them then? Because if he's speaking about dead unbelievers, it would be very different to if he was proclaiming to dead believers or fallen angels. So when you consider the what did Jesus proclaim, well, some have said, well, okay, if it was was unbelievers, maybe he proclaimed to them an opportunity for repentance. He was giving them one last chance before the end of history is wrapped up. Or maybe if it was those who had trusted in God, who were faithful, maybe he was proclaiming to them the completing of redemption. You know, it's okay, hang on, one day we're all going to be together, it's fine. And he was proclaiming that. Or maybe it was fallen angels or sinners and he was proclaiming a final condemnation for anyone who heard him. You see, it could be either, really. And then when did it happen? Well, it says in Noah's day, so maybe it was actually in the time of Noah. Uh, Others have interpreted and said, well, when Jesus was between the the death and the resurrection, he somehow descended into this situation where there were some angels or unbelievers or dead believers, don't know, or and what he did then was between his death and resurrection, he proclaimed something to them. Others have said this is after the resurrection. Now, this may sound ever, ever so confusing. Can I just help you a little bit by saying that there are at least five very well-respected positions on interpreting this verse? So if you don't agree with what I'm about to say, that's absolutely fine, as long as you take the time to reason it through and work it out. I think, and there are some that would, I'd, I'd concur with who are theologically wired, I think that what happened was in the spiritual realm of existence, Jesus went back and in Noah's day used Noah and preached through Noah to his generation and They are the ones that are now in the prison of hell awaiting the final redemption of all things. Okay, so they're kind of in an intermediate state. You know, when we when we die, we won't notice it. We'll be, you know, dead but then present with the Lord. We won't notice the gap. But there clearly is a gap because we exist a lot later than these people died, understand? So so went back and preached to those that had formerly disobeyed 
And what he said, what he proclaimed, uh, I guess if it's unbelievers, then he proclaimed their final condemnation. If it's believers, then presumably he proclaimed to them their final redemption. Uh, Wayne Grudem, theologian, he put it like this. In the spiritual realm of existence, Christ went and preached through Noah to those who are now spirits in the prison of hell. This happened when they formally disobeyed, when the patience of God was waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Now, the thing I want you to go away with is not, okay, that was a really complex little bit of scripture. I still don't really understand it or know what it means. I want you to understand what this means for us because actually it's worth unpacking because the important thing is God spoke through Noah to his generation. And the important takeaway for us out of all of this, and the reason why I'm bothering to unpack this strange verse, is that it's actually a huge encouragement to us. Because it means that God can come and anoint human flesh and use it to preach to unbelievers. You have human flesh. I have human flesh. That means that if God is the same yesterday and today and forever, it means that he can come and anoint you to be a mouthpiece to your generation. It means that God can come and give you the words to say, to proclaim gospel life to those who are perishing. It means he can anoint and equip every single believer to connect the gospel to their generation. So the encouragement is not to get confused over a challenging verse of scripture. The encouragement is to go forth and proclaim the gospel in our day and to those around us. So let me bring us back to the final flood. Flood number three. The first flood was the flood of Noah, a flood of judgment over the whole of humanity. The second flood is the flood of baptism, that beautiful picture that demonstrates your internal salvation. The third flood is also a global flood. And it's the flood of the gospel of grace. You see, today's verses begin and end with Jesus, the bread in the sandwich, top and bottom. And that's where I want to draw things to a close, by looking most closely at what it tells us about Jesus, because that's always where we're going to be most edified. So verse 18, the top slice of bread, and then verse 22, the bottom slice of bread, both about Jesus. Just dwell in it with me for a moment, because the first verse talks about his suffering and his death and why, and then the last verse tells us about where he is now. Let me read verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then skip on to the other slice of bread, verse 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Let's just look at that verse 18 for a moment and let it do you good. If you're a believer this morning, let this do you good. It says, Peter says, and he writes once. Christ suffered once. Important word because it means once was enough. It means it's a finished, completed work. It means no one else needs to suffer because Jesus has suffered already. It means that God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. It means we don't have to do anything else now to earn our salvation. Once. Done. Over. Finished. Completed. Once, he says, for sins, plural. My sins, your sins, their sins, the sins in Noah's time, the sins in your great-great-grandchildren's time, all sins, all sins. That means whatever your life has meant thus far, whatever your life has entailed, it means wherever it goes in the future, Christ's death is still effective to cleanse you from any unrighteousness because he died once for all sins. Not some sins, not a few sins, not the big sins, not the public sins, not the confessed sins. He died once for all sins, which means there is always grace. There is always grace. 
whenever you fall, whenever you fail. There is always grace because he's already died. He's always already been raised to life. God is already satisfied. He's already proclaiming you not guilty. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's good news, isn't it? Once for all sins, righteous for the unrighteous. This is madness. Righteous, how many righteous in this whole of scripture, really? One. Jesus. So the one was exchanged for the, the unrighteous. How many people unrighteous in human history? Everybody else. <laughs> I mean, this is madness to think that one life, one solitary life, can be exchanged for the sin of the whole of humanity. But that's the reality. That's the reality. That's why he sweat blood in the garden. That's why he was in excruciating spirit, physical and spiritual agony on the cross. Because it was all sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, the one for the many. You see, this is a profound exchange. And it's not just, as you know, it's not just the removal of our sin. It's this positive endowment of his righteousness. He clothes us with that. I mean, how incredible is that? That he doesn't just cleanse us, but he clothes us in his righteousness. Imputed to us. Why? What well, it says in the verse that he might bring us to God. Oh, joy. This thing is what brings us to God. You thought, Hang on a minute, I thought I became a Christian. No, you didn't. Jesus brought you to God. God spotted you. History passed, prehistory. Said, I'm going to have Samson. I'm going to have him. Yeah, Carly, I'm going to have her. Viv, I'm going to have her. Now, what am I going to do to draw her to me? To draw him to me. Hey, Chris Kilby, I'm going to have him. Well, like, how am I going to get him? Ooh, that's going to be a difficult one. No, not for him. He draws us to God. He brings us to God. This is quite incredible. And that's why he died once for all. To restore that. That love that God had for us. But boy, what a cost. What a cost. Peter says, being put to death in the flesh. I mean, this was real. This was blood and guts. This was nails and hammers. This was swords and spears and whips. I went down into my shed and got the biggest nails I could find. Um, I mean, can you imagine the pain of a mallet driving it through my wrist or through my ankle? And then the pain of me hanging on those, waiting for my body to give up. I mean, it's just horrific, but it's very real. Dead dead, death in the flesh. But what turnaround? Made alive in the spirit. Jesus, though dead, is alive. I mean, that moment of suffering has bought for us an immeasurable eternal inheritance. Yes, he died, really died. But then afterwards, they poked him and he was alive. He went and had breakfast with them on the beach. He taught them. He loved them. And then he promised he'd never leave them or forsake them. And he never has. And he's still here with us today. It's good news, isn't it? Wow, alive in the spirit. So now having satisfied God's judgment, having satisfied God's wrath, having been raised to life, the chapter finishes with where he is now. Boy, oh boy, he's gone into heaven. He's at the right hand of God with the angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. And here's the incredible thing. You are there with him if you are in Christ. Come on, we're raised with Christ. 
We're seated in heavenly places in Christ. It means the church is the institution now on earth that carries the authority of Christ. When you go into your workplace, you carry the authority of Christ. When you pray for the sick, you carry the authority of Christ. When he's there interceding for you, you've got the prayers of Jesus urging you on. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. So, floods. First flood, that flood of judgment, corresponds to baptism. Remember I said to you, in the early church, there weren't any people that had become believers who weren't baptized. It was part of the deal. Yeah? Into Christ, into the water, into the church. <clears throat> done. Where are you in that? Have you done all that? Have you received the whole package? Have you given that visible demonstration of your massive internal change? Or are you yet to do that? You see, because it can't be done to you. So if the only thing you've ever experienced is a slightly strange vicar sprinkling you with water, you didn't believe when that happened. You can't have believed. The only thing you could really do was dribble and fill your nappy. Maybe cry as well. Do you understand? So if you've become a believer, crack on. Come into Christ. Come into the waters of baptism. Come into the church. Maybe you've been baptized, but you've never really said, yeah, and that's made me part of the body of the church. And you kind of flit around from church to church, or you think, actually, I don't really need the church, you know, all this organized religion stuff. Well, I'm sorry, Jesus doesn't agree with you. Neither does Peter, neither does Paul, neither do I. Okay, if you're a Christian, get into the body. Get into a body. It doesn't have to be here, but commit to being part of a local body, because that's what it means to be involved. And then we're part of that third flood, this great global flood of the gospel of grace that's going to the nations of the world. You get to do what Noah did in his day carrier of the gospel, getting people onto the ark, getting them in, populating heaven, bringing glory to Jesus as you do. I'd like us to celebrate the good news that's come to us. And I wonder if the band could come up and uh, listen, I'm not going to give an appeal for you to respond personally to the gospel of Jesus. If you want to become a Christian today, just do it. You can just say, Jesus, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow you. That's fine. And then tell somebody afterwards. If you want to talk to somebody about baptism, though, do grab somebody after the meeting over coffee. And we've left some leaflets outside that will help you to think through what the Bible says about baptism. And I want to urge you to do it. Do it out of obedience to Jesus, because he said do it. Out of obedience to his word, which is do it. And out of a response of the heart that says, he's died for me. How could I withhold anything from I want to do it. So, so do it. And if you know others that need to have that prompt, get them to listen to this sermon or take a leaflet for them too. Because wouldn't it be amazing if we were all gloriously testifying to what Jesus has done in our life in that very public way. Why don't we stand together? Jesus, I just want to thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you that you didn't give up or back off but you were prepared to go to the cross for me. Thank you that that brought me to God. <laughs> I've never been alone since. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you were satisfied with that one offering, that one life, that incredible exchange, the one righteous one for the multitude of us who are unrighteous. And now we're in. We're in the ark. We're in Christ. We're saved. We're rescued. And that's an eternal inheritance. And we'll receive it. And it can never spoil. It can never fade. Tim Keller's right now enjoying what it is to be in eternity with you. Thank you. And that will be our story one day, that we'll be able to look you and see you in the face, face to face and say, thank you. And you'll say, come in, I've got a room ready for you. <laughs> come on, let's worship. Let's worship that great invitation to join in with the multitudes who no man can count from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Thank you, God. Let's... let's, let's Let's sing and let's just love him. <laughs>